Oops. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about some of the Power BI development best practices to help make your Power BI environment great. So first of all, a little bit about me. I'm Andy Letourneau, and I'm a BI consultant with Pragmatic Works. You can contact me through my Pragmatic Works email or on Twitter at Lady Runa. A quick summary about myself. I have a bachelor's in mathematics and physics, and I've got a little over 20 years of experience with SQL, both as a developer and a DBA. And sewing is my superpower. All right. So many reports, so little time. What do we do? It feels like, to me, a goat rodeo when dealing with these reports. There's just so much to deal with. So how do we get a handle on this report development backlog? We've got a ton buried in requests. What do we do? First of all, we need to take an inventory of all the reports that you have so that you know which reports are being worked on and by whom, and then find out uh, are there any duplicates? Sometimes five requests might actually be a single one once you look at it, because each one may be the same report, except they just have a slightly different filter. So create the report with five filters on there, and now you've essentially taken care of five report requests. Other things to look at in your backlog is are the reports relevant or correct? That is the existing ones. Sometimes you have some, they are just totally wrong and they should be eliminated because we want to have correct data. And then also, how do you determine uh, how far you've made on it? How can you track your progress? So first of all, let's take a look at tracking the bag backlog because that's kind of the, the big thing is once we get a handle on some of it, we've got this list, a pile of papers, how are we going to track it? Well, depending upon the size of the development team, if you have a really large team, DevOps at dev.azure.com is great. It's a full agile system, but it's really overkill for smaller teams. Small teams with as only maybe two, three developers aren't going to need that. In fact, if you're the only guy in the shop, you probably could just take care of your backlog, tracking it in OneNote or Excel or any of the other Office 365 systems simply because you don't have to share it. Therefore, as long as you have it written down in an organized place, you'll be able to track it so that you can show management, this is what I've done, this is what we have to do. For small teams, which are, you know, I'd say, uh, say two to eight people or so, perhaps Planner in Office 365 might be your easiest choice. And in fact, I'm going to show you that because there's some nice things that you can do to integrate that with Power BI, since Power BI is part of Office 365. As you know, in Power BI, we have different work groups. Well, each work group can also have its own Power BI thing. So you can see that you could have your information in Planner, which is also going to be, to some degree, linked or directly associated with each of your other groups. So what I did here is I pulled up, oh, there we go, dismiss. I pulled up a planner. Again, it's tasks.office.com if you want to use the web-based one. You can see I've created an example planner showing that I have some tasks left. These are for reports. So let's go take a look at that. I'm going to add a new plan, and this is going to go for 16. <laughs> I can't type. There we go. Now, you can add it to an existing office group. And then you can also make it public, which means everybody in the organization can see it, or you can say private, and only I can see the plan contents as well as the people that I tend to add to it. Uh, since this is something that we don't need to show to everybody, I'm just going to leave it as private. You can also type in a, a description of it, where you want to do it. And then all you do is hit Create Plan. Now, since I've already created uh, some others, Oh, I shouldn't have hit that. Okay. Um, you can link it into uh, Teams, and so that's exactly what I've done here with this pretty much. You just hit Settings, uh, plus add a new one, and you can add your planner in there. Let's see if that other one has created yet. There it is. Okay. Oh, it's still creating. Okay, we're going to go back here. So to use planner, you can use it within the Teams application, or you can use it in the web page. And since I 
created the plan in the web page and it's still locked up just so we're not sitting there watching it spin uh, I'm going to work in with this it's very simple to add new things you just add a new task report thing you can set a due date if there is a due date when it's going to be due and assign it to somebody I'll assign it to myself and then you can just add a task and there you go so you can keep adding additional ones but I click on the one that I just added I can describe it and I'm because I'm talking I can't type and talk uh, so you can describe it there you can also add checklist items so thing one thing two so you can add checklist things and these things can be checked off as you're doing them so you can see that this here will work for multiple steps you can also add comments in here this would be good for more details on your report description who's it for what the managers think about it and anything that you can think of that you think would be relevant for this because you would have somebody who's entering this such as a manager might be entering the data and then the people who are actually developing the reports are going to go in and take a look at this another thing you can do is assign for each of these labels you could call these priority priority one two three through six choose the label that you like and then that one would count so in this case I'd call that priority three and then you just close it and there it is now you can see the due date you can see that I have some tasks I can then move this into different lanes you can create the buckets of any name that you want so perhaps you might have why did this not go away uh, you might have say sales reports or new reports report changes whatever buckets that make sense for what you're doing the tabs can be for different colors for priorities when you have completed the report you can just hit your little check box and it shows completed and marks it off as done so this can work pretty well for as I said a medium-sized team and because it's integrated in teams and with office 365 you have everything all directly associated with one particular group so that is teams let's see did that actually create there it is so that's what an empty one looks like so either in the web you can do this the same one that I was working on webinar for no my favorite there it is so here it is this is the same one as you can see it got instantly updated in addition to the board view you can have some charts and since this one has some data you can see here some report changes showing that I've completed some things I've got a few items in progress and it lets you know how far things things are in progress within this particular thing so you can see in this one I since I'm the only one who has things assigned it doesn't look as interesting as it would be if there were ones for others we can also have a schedule you can see here I scheduled the sales dashboard to go for a week and then I said report thing that new one has to be done just on the 19th that I'm not going to be spending the time on there you'll see that if they're in progress they're marked that way and if they haven't been started there's no marking on there so you might want to consider using that for managing your backlog if you don't want to go into all the way over to DevOps or JIRA or some other big agile system all right next so more for managing the backlog remove duplicates yes that sounds like a duplicate I am going to keep touting that I've found that 80% of the reports are going to be very similar to each other they might have all the same data so it's very important what you should do of course is prioritize the items which ones are the most important to get done then estimate the work effort how much effort is this going to be usually when I estimate the work uh, effort I, I do it by t-shirt sizes you know small medium large extra large the reason is because that's a lot easier for people to grasp than for them to try to finger an exact number of hours or days that this is probably going to take them but if you say well this report you know it's an extra large okay we know it is a bigger project we're going to expect that one to take longer than say a medium report so that might be um, you know how you can figure out okay where can we fit these in what can we get done iterative approach 
is a very important way of getting your reports along to let the report consumers feel like you're actually getting somewhere. Create the initial portion of report based on what they have requested. And maybe you only have a third of it done. Show them what you've got. Instead of keeping them in suspense until you've completed the whole thing, show them what you've got this week and then have them give you comments on it. You might find that there's a lot of changes that uh, you know they don't like certain kinds of charts that you have or they really, really, really want that pie chart added. So you find out what they want and then the following week you call them back again to take a look at the next version. You might even be able to publish the partially created report if there's a portion of it or a page or two that have been approved you can publish that and then go on and continue to build a report until they get the information that they want to have from them. And of course, the last part of managing the backlog is make sure you assign it to content creators because if it's not assigned to anybody, it's not going to get done. Okay, so how can we make reports themselves a little bit more efficient? Well, if you've got too many measures or measures scattered throughout tables, if you create measure tables to logically group and organize measures, this will make it easier for you to handle them. First of all, with a measures table, you're going to be able to see if you have any duplicate measures because you might have something called sales total and another one called total sales. Are they the same? Maybe. But if you put them all together in a measures table, they'll be near each other and it'll be a lot easier to see than they would if they were scattered among a bunch of different tables. So how do we create one? In Power BI, in Edit Queries, you click Edit Data to create a one column, one row table. And then click OK, and then save that. So now you just have this little table, you've called it Measure Table, and it has one column, but it doesn't really look like it has any meaning. But if you then go to one of your measures, and then you click on the Modeling tab, and change the Home Table from say sales inventory to key measures, it will then jump into the measures table. You can then go and hide column one in the measure table because we only needed it as a placeholder in order to initially create the measures table. Then just go back and go to every single one of your measures and put them in the measures table. You could even create multiple different measures table as I'm showing here on the right. So for moving averages, I put all the moving averages in one. All of the ranking type measures were put in one. All of the time comparison measures were put in one table. This makes it a little bit easier, especially for content creators who are now going to take your data set and then attempt to create reports. If they have the measures focused in there, then they know, oh, I just have to look in the moving averages thing to go find it rather than trying to search through 20 different tables to figure out where it is. Okay. Next, use shared data models. What is a shared data model? Well, a shared data model is you create essentially an empty PIVX file, PBIX, on your desktop and create that as the one source of the truth. It should contain all the measures and it should be a good data set that you know you can use, like say, let's call it a sales master data model. It's gonna have all your sales information in it. Publish that one to Power BI. Then report developers can go in and when they hit get, get data, choose Power BI data sets and then use that single data set as a resource for all of the reports. This ensures that you don't have, again, five different measures called sales total in five different reports, they're all calculated differently. You're using just the single version of how you would like it to be done so that we do have more accurate data. Okay, next, source control, vitally important. There's nothing worse than hearing oops from a developer and then discovering that a whole month of work has disappeared. Right now we have a very large selection of possible things that you can use for source control. Depending upon what kind of team you have, you might uh, already have some established. So you could use Git or GitHub. 
This is a open source Apache subversion. That's another open source. Azure repos in DevOps. Those are great. Um, and that would integrate right with your Azure. And if you have end users who are creating reports, you could always put it on SharePoint. SharePoint maintains older versions. So if I am editing something in SharePoint, it's going to save multiple versions of it. So even though SharePoint is a very primitive uh, type of version control, that can work if you've got content creators who are maybe not necessarily in the IT department or any other department where they tend to already use real source control. But I would definitely recommend that you choose one of the three well-known ones, or if you find another source control system that works for you, the most important thing is have backups. The more, <laughs> because if you don't have a backup, it might as well not exist. Okay, next, report efficiencies. KonMari, your existing reports. You knew I'd have to bring her up. If it doesn't spark joy in everyone, it should be eliminated. Now, of course, that's, <laughs> that's a little extreme. I mean, obviously, certain reports aren't going to spark joy because they're showing that the company's not doing well and people aren't going to be happy with that. But if that's the truth, that's what you need to see. So again, duplicate reports are ones with maybe they've got 80% of the same columns, but just a few columns were different, or are nearly the same, but have slightly different parameters or sorting options. Those reports can be combined. You can add more filters. You, again, you're going to be using that master data set that you have up there. And so that's going to make it a lot easier for you to create these reports by making sure that, hey, you know, I've got five report requests, but actually they're all the same report. So that actually kills, lowers your backlog really fast. Another thing you want to look for is reports that were never used. If you've got a bunch of existing reports, uh, go take a look at and see, well, when was this last access? Has anybody looked at it? If they're not looking at it, we don't need it. If there are any reports that are completely empty, sometimes for whatever reason, the old data, it just never populates. Get rid of it. Or the report is just plain wrong. The calculations are off. Then it shouldn't be in there. Finally, reports referencing retired systems should be gone because we're not using those systems anymore. We don't want people looking at them. So what's the KonMari steps? Okay, check to see who's using them. If not, remove access and see who complains. After about 90 days, you can safely delete anything. Because if nobody says, I, I haven't seen a report, then delete it. They, ha they haven't looked at it. They haven't complained that they don't have access anymore. Then it's fine. Next, mark official reports with certified by my team, whatever your team name is. This can help distinguish official reports from ad hoc reports. You're always going to have ad hoc report requests. However, the official reports should be the ones that are developed by the report team and have been approved by management so that you know, yes, this is the one source of the truth. Other things for report efficiencies. Handle transformation logic in Power Query to prepare tables for the data model. Things like renaming columns, changing data types, stuff like that. My antivirus popped up, okay. Um, that way you can make sure that your reports run more efficient, efficiently. With database sources, query folding and incremental refresh policies only work well against tables and views, not stored procedures and inline SQL. You also would want to make sure you use column and measure names that sort well and are self-describing in the context of the entire data model. So sum of sales amount and sum of quantity may not be intuitive, but total quantity and total sales might work a little better. Again, make sure it's something that the users of the reports are going to be able to understand and the developers are going to be understand what they mean. Uh, remove unnecessary columns in queries to reduce the model size. If you have from Salesforce, you have the notes field included in the sales table. Most of the time you're not going to be reporting on the notes field. You know, the notes field is open text. So that would be one of the columns that you shouldn't bring in and it would definitely reduce the size because those are huge. And then finally, avoid bi-directional filters. 
Uh, they, they tend to be inefficient and slow things down. Bi bidirectional filters are ones where they filter on either side of it. If you can avoid those, those are much better. So uh, how do we keep up with Power BI features? You know, Power BI is like Kaiju Kitty. Every time you see it, it gets bigger and there's more to it. So first of all, look at the Power BI blog. If you follow the Power BI blog, uh, you're going to learn about all of the new Power BI features. You can subscribe to the Power BI blog and you can add the RSS feed to Teams. So what I'm going to do is close that. And here's the Power BI blog. One of the things that you can see is here it is, you know, our April update. It tells you when the new version is coming out. It tells you when the gateways are updated and all of that. Definitely sign up for it. And that's just powerbi.microsoft.com slash en-us slash block. Now, if you want, you could also subscribe to their RSS feed. And if you click on the subscribe button there, uh, basically it's going to pop up the XML of the RSS feed. But at least there you can go and grab the URL, just copy it. And then if you go into here, you can see that we have actually integrated the Power BI blog within this. So you can just you can turn on a channel. Oh, it's going to take too long to load. And then just find RSS. And where did it go? Okay. You can hook in the RSS feed, and for some reason I have totally forgotten how to do that. But hook the RSS feed in there, and then you can go view it. You'll also see that we discuss things such as, hey, you know, we've heard about some of the new stuff that is happening. You know, the server machine, dev tests. We've got questions that show up periodically along with the RSS feed. Because that's how when you hear about new things, if you talk about it, you can learn more about it. All right, that's Power BI blog. Next, do some lunch and learn. Yes, I know you probably feel like, yeah, but my lunch is my one time to do it. But if you have each person on the team present something they learned this week or this month in Power BI, then you can easily just over your lunch hours every once in a while, pick up some new stuff. You could also watch some Pragmatic Works free webinars. Uh, you could demonstrate new features, show some DAX that you learned, or any other tricks. You can also demonstrate some of the reports you created and get feedback on them, or talk about what you've learned on the blog. I, I think that this would really be a very handy thing, even at Pragmatic Works, we have lunch and learns. Now, of course, for us, since we're in all different time zones, the lunch time for me <laughs> is usually eight o'clock in the morning. But definitely work on those and see what you can do for that. Can you go back to the previous slide? Okay, so hold on. You want before the team launch and let this one? Power BI with source control. Okay, I'm not sure which slide Deborah Martin would like me to go back to, but before the lunch and learn slide. Yes, okay, the Power BI blog, there's, <laughs> okay, I think she just wanted the link to the, the Power BI blog. All right, so and then finally, after the lunch and, earn, huh, lunch and learn, is find somebody who can be the Power BI subject matter expert. So, I'd suggest that you volunteer to be the subject matter expert for Power BI. This gives you an excuse to read the Power BI log. You can help run the lunch and learn sessions. Find other sources of information on Power BI, such as uh, Power BI user groups. Uh, you can watch some of the Pragmatic Works training. There's a free dashboard in a day, which, okay, kill that. So here it is, always free, Dashwood in the Day class forever. This is on pragmaticworks.com. And just click on the training, go to on-demand training. And in there, you can see there's the always free Dashboard in the Day class. Also, for seven days, you get any of these classes free. Or you can go and look at some of these. Apparently, we have $100, uh, we have $100 off Elite Training Sale, which is going to be going for 
almost another two weeks. So take a look at those. And of course, if you go to the free stuff, you can see the list of all of the seminars, including the one that we're doing. How do you get the RSS feed into Teams again? That is a good question. And so I am going to, notepad, I'm going to check to see. I thought I had written up how to do that. All right, so actually we are ready for questions. And I am going to see about getting that RSS feed. Oh, what was the thing? Where did it go? Ah, connectors, that's what it is. I knew I clicked on the wrong spot. Okay, so to get the RSS feed in there, you hit connectors. And you wait, and wait. <laughs> and then see, it says get RSS feeds for your groups. If I hit configure, because we've I've already got an RSS feed, then you enter a name, Power BI, and then the address, is that in? Wait a minute, let me see what's in my paste thing. It is, okay. I just didn't want to paste in something too random. Paste that in, and then the digest frequency, how often do you want this updated? And if you do that, you hit save. I'm not going to do that because we already have a copy of the RSS feed in there, but just hit save. So very simple, once you remember which place to go to, is just hit connectors and then you can go add it in there. And I think this is also good for any other RSS feed. We do have, for example, in our Azure one, we sometimes have uh, some feeds in there. We've got a Microsoft feed in there. So go in there and pull in any of these feeds. So this way you're, you're getting direct links. This goes directly to the Power BI blog. Also, an edit tab, click on more apps. Thank you. <laughs> I knew there was a way to do that. Um, okay, so let me go back to the presentation here. Oops. All right, well, that's actually all I had for you, although I did see that a handful of questions have popped in in addition to that one. So let me scroll up uh, da, 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 on premise. Recommendation on. Report request templates and report data dictionary. Excellent question, Rolando. So for report request or business requirement templates, uh, that would be something we don't, as far as I know, there isn't really any kind of official template. A lot of times what I've seen is pretty much list out the major bullet points for the things that you know that you want to have in the report. This would be, okay, what's the title going to be? What's the data? Do you know the data source? You know, is this, is this data from Salesforce or is this data from our CRM system? Is this data from accounting? So, you know, where, where does it come from? Which columns do you think you need? And then the main thing, especially when you're getting this from end users, is I would have them just go to a whiteboard and draw pictures of what they want to see. That's usually the easiest thing because when they say, oh, well, I want uh, sales over time. Okay, how exactly do you mean that? But if they draw a picture of it, they're going to show you without necessarily needing the vocabulary. They've got something in their mind and they can just kind of draw a sketch of, yeah, I want to look at my dashboard in this particular format. As far as a report data dictionary, uh, depending upon what you want, I've seen report data dictionaries simply done in Excel where you just have uh, different columns that are covering the information. I've also used uh, the wiki, which is part of Teams. Teams, you can create a wiki, you can put the information in there, and that, of course, would be going probably into the wiki of the group that you're developing the report for. So there's a, a couple different places that you could do it. There, unfortunately, I wish that there were some real templates that uh, you know are publicly available that would work. But generally speaking, because every business is different, it's a lot harder to you know have a standard template because each one has uh, specific different requirements. Another thing, of course, that you would definitely want on your template, I would say, would be. Uh, the priority or importance of the report, you know, is this considered a critical business business critical report? Is this an ad hoc one-time report? Or is this kind of 
not just a use it every week kind of report. You know, the report types would also be important. Okay, and then Megan asked to confirm measure table is for content creators to find standard units of measures. Yes, the that, that table, let me just pop back to it, is definitely for, it, it's, it makes it so that when you create all of your measures, which are things done in DAX, in Power BI, here it is, you want to make sure that the report, the content creators can actually find them. If you've got 10 tables, and you, but you've got 50 different measures, if they're all scattered throughout those tables, it'll be really hard to find them. However, if you put them together and you gather them into groups, then they will be less likely to mix them up with regular columns, and they will also be able to recognize them. As you know, in Power BI, and you can see this on the slide here, a measure has a little calculator icon next to it. So you can always find them by looking for the icon. But if they're all put in their little measure tables here, it, makes, it just makes it a little bit easier to organize them for people. Okay, Power BI with source control. Power BI with source control with embedded data can be quite large. Ooh, that's true. And how do we best version these items? Okay. Um, yeah, if you've got the embedded data, they're definitely going to be huge. Right now, I don't think there's another way of doing it. Technically, these Power BI files, pretty much if you look at them, it turns out it's like a zip file, and it has uh, a bunch of little files inside them. Some of it's encrypted, some of it's not. So to some degree, source control uh, might be able to handle it, though most of the time when I've done it, we have switched from embedded to, say, direct query so that we don't have these huge files. And also, if you're going to be using uh, what I had showed you, now I have to remember where I put it. This one, measure tables, this one, yes. The shared data model here. This is one way that you can help reduce the amount of embedded, is that you're pretty much you're gonna create one data model you're going to put that up on Power BI, and then everybody else is going to be referencing to that Power BI data set. So now instead of having, if you've got 10 reports that are all using pretty much the same data set, because only one of them is going to have the data in it, the others are just having a reference to that thing, and that's one way that you can help reduce how much embedded data you have. Okay. I already show the RSS blog. Uh, okay, when developing the data model, this is from Ian, is it better to do inline SQL joining multiple tables or import raw tables and do all manipulations of Power Query oh, and create specific table relationships in the data model? Oh, goody, I get to use the Microsoft answer. It depends. It depends on what is what is the nature of the tables. Typically, what I've seen that works out better is instead of taking, say, directly from Salesforce and doing a report on it, is take your Salesforce data and bring that into a database. Massage that a bit so that you can combine the tables and information that that needs to be combined, especially if you have some very complex queries or some hoop jumping that have to go through in order to get it in there. And then you can go and import the tables and link data together. That is probably one of the better ways of doing it. I've also seen if you have some very complex data manipulation to do is run a stored procedure to create a reporting table. And that stored procedure will be something that's doing all of the multiple joining on tables. Because if you just import the raw tables and try to do the joining, there are many cases, especially in uh, CRM systems, where they're not, table A is not joining to table B on a single column. They're joining on and they've got three related columns. Power BI relationships cannot handle multi-column relationships like that. They really only just join on one column. So in that case, 
you're definitely far better off to have all your joins handled beforehand and either have a big view that handles everything or as I said use a stored procedure to go create it. How you share data sets and metrics in new reports. Do I have a data set to share? I might. Um, let me check at our powerbi.com and see if I have. The question is, can you elaborate on how you share data sets and metrics in new reports? So in other words, if we're doing that, and this was uh, referring to this with a shared data model. Now let me see if Power BI has come up. I got to sign in first. Oh, come on. Power BI takes its time about letting me sign in sometimes. All right, let me see if I have, a, I think I have a sample report on here already, at least I hope I do. Come on, Power BI, be nice. There he goes. All right. Oh, uh, I have an example. Okay. There's your data week data, there we go. All right, come on, load up. So here you can see that I have this data set called Azure Data Week data. Now this is in my workspace. I don't want to necessarily go on the company workspaces because I don't know uh, for sure what reports they have. But I have loaded up a data set here. Now if I pop open uh, Power BI, oh look at that, he's right there. E. So what I did is I created this Azure Data Week data. This was a Power BI report, the PIVX file, which I just went and published. And I'm just going to close this, and we're going to use a new report. So I had already published one. If I hit Get Data and do this, so I did Get Data and Power BI data sets, I'm now looking at a bunch of these. So if I go into my workspace and I hit Azure Data Week data and I hit Load, that's it. I am now loading that data, which you saw here on PowerBI.com. So I can load that data, and there it is. There's the data. It is loaded in Power BI. So, oh, it won't let you do it again. Really, it's just, there we go. When you hit Get Data and you hit Power BI Data Sets, that gives you a list of all of the data sets that you have available. So that should cover it for Arvind. And then... Can Power BI, so Mahesh asks, can Power BI work like SSIS, that's load EBCID flat file data to SQL format ASCII? Power BI isn't really uh, SSIS. It can read flat file data. And if the flat file has been read in, it's going to be read in as a table. So in that case, you could... Uh, use that as a data source, just like you can use Excel as a data source. So in here, oh, I've already got data, so I'd have to hit a new one, new. So when you pop up a new version of Power BI, if you hit get data, if I have a text file on my system, I could go pull it up. Okay, so yeah, let me close that. Yeah, so in get data, basically, yes, yeah, so if you have it, if it's a CSV or any of the format, pretty much any data type, I hit more on that list. If it's any of these data types, even from PDFs, you can get that. All right, so Julio Martins said, every time I upload a data set, Power BI creates a report with the same name. Is that correct? Can I change this behavior? Power BI, whenever you hit publish, so let me just cancel that. When you hit publish, it's going to upload it and save it based on the name that you have named the file. So the only way that you could create a report uh, automatically with a different name would be to save the report as something else and then upload that. The other option, of course, is once it's been uploaded, then you can go and manually change it within Power BI. But most of the time, I usually just save them. So in here, I could go and rename it Data Stuff. There you go. So in Power BI, you can go rename your reports. Um, the only problem is, is that does sometimes, to some degree, break the direct connection. I usually 
leave them with the same name. So I'd pr I think it would be better if you save that with the, the name that you want to have it if you don't want it to overwrite the previous one. Ooh, version control using Git. <laughs> um, I don't have Git turned on in my system, so I can't really demonstrate it, but pretty much with Git or any other version control system, most of the time you're just going to be, you, you will edit the file, and if you're saving it in the same directory, when you tell it to save the changes and publish the changes, then it's going to be uploading the latest version. So, and that works actually with all of the, the different version control systems. So that's from div v. How about Microsoft Data Catalog? Yes, Arvind, you could use Microsoft Data Catalog as your, I assume you're talking about for the data dictionary. That would be a good choice. How to do source control without putting data into PBIX from Mike. Oh, he's left. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, again, that was what I had said previously, that uh, if, you, if you're using them with the linked data sets, like I just mentioned here, then those linked data sets will allow you to reduce the amount of data that's going into, PBI, in, into your source control. Your other option that I've seen people do is with this, if you do file, save as, and then change it to a Power BI template table, this will save all of your content without the data. And then you would have to go and create a PBIX file. It's one way of doing it, it's a little bit ponderous, but it can be done. Is there a free course for Power BI beginner? Yes, I had mentioned that earlier, uh, Preeti, I think that's how you say the name and whoops that definitely here this dashboard in a day class that is a free course for power bi beginner takes you from hi this is power bi to yay i have a really cool report so definitely it's at the right price it's free of course if you want more power bi courses there's a power bi pack and a few others but definitely go look at that and then to also take a look at our other webinars that we have. Okay, is Get Data Source Power BI data sets only applicable to cloud and not on-prem? That is correct. The power, well, the Power BI data sets, that is referring to uh, the data sets that you already have up on Power BI. So those would definitely be uh, cloud only. Now, technically speaking, when you uploaded that data set, that data set could be one that was referring to something on-premises, and if you do have that, you'd have to use the data gateway to uh, communicate between the two, and that would just be going to update the data. So to some degree, that's technically still on-prem. You know, you have your on-prem SQL server, you use a data gateway, and then you have that data set uh, on in Power BI. So that's kind of the closest you're gonna get to uh, on-prem is, is doing it that way. The ways to generate reports based on some trigger in your query. So if you have a SQL job that returns a list of servers, can you then generate a report with that server name as a parameter? Uh, there are ways of using, of creating parameters with Power BI reports. So you probably could do that. Um, it's not something that I'm prepared to demonstrate right now but take a look at using parameters in Power BI. And they've actually even added some cool stuff uh, within uh, the uh, edit query section over here that will actually allow you to add parameters and it will actually have them. Let me see where to go. I don't have any data in here, so it's not gonna let me show it. Oh, that's nice, okay. I can't do anything because I don't have any queries in this. But yes, there are ways of doing that. You could just go look up uh, using the parameters and then the report could, yeah, it can do it with a server name. I've done that a while ago. I'd have to find the demo. RSS doesn't show up in your list of connectors and teams. Um, you should, uh, Chris, go search for it and you might be able to find it. I'm not sure 
why it doesn't show up unless perhaps uh, you might have to check with your Office 365 manager to see if maybe he's blocked that. That is possible. Uh, you know, they might say, well, we, we don't want RSS feeds as connectors. And if so, ask them why, and then maybe they will. Um, okay, and I think, let's see. I have a report that uses data, this is from Nick Gazzano, uses data from a SharePoint list which is updated regularly from Power Apps. Is there a way to refresh a report real time or is Power BI restricted to eight refreshes a day? You can refresh uh, manually, but uh, the closest to real time would be as if you were able to set that up with uh, what's called a, a direct connection. So if I, new source, oh, I don't have any data sources ready. But yeah, you could, uh, I don't have any good examples of this, but when you do create a connection, uh, I'll just throw up SQL Server, even though my, my SQL's not running. But instead of doing, and you can do this for most other connections, I'm doing it with SQL, uh, but I'm not gonna put my server name in because he's not turned on. Data connectivity mode, if as long as you've got the option of choosing direct query for your data connectivity mode, direct query will actually read from the source rather than doing the refreshes. The refreshes are needed for uh, imported data. Okay, create a Power BI model using other Power BI models as sources. Good question, Julio. Um, well, when you create that Power BI, when you use that Power BI model, uh, now I think I think you're stuck with just that specific one uh, because it it doesn't really mix very well. How optimized is Power BI for ODBC connections from VNA? Um, reasonably good. I'm not sure how I would uh, classify it. Again, it depends when your ODBC connection, how efficient is the source database that you're connecting to. Obviously, if that server's running slow, Power BI will be slow. If that is very quick and efficient for querying, then it should work pretty well. For the most part, Power BI uh, does some very, very good con uh, quick connection work. So I think it should be fine for ODBC. Is the report based on a template and how did you, oh, how did you add the filters pane? Okay, that one I can answer. Uh, where'd the filters pane go? It is right here. This is the April version. This was just announced. This is a new thing. It just appeared. I do believe though that you have to, under options and settings, options. So file, options and setting, options. And I think it is a preview feature. Let's see, is it new filter experience? So if you want the new filters pane to show up, which actually is really cool, you can read about it on the Power BI blog. That's in the April release. It is it is the latest version of Power BI has that. Right now it's a preview feature. It's called the new filter experience. And if you click on here, this is going to give you more information about how it works. Power BI report filter preview is the, the page there. Go ahead and take a look at that and that'll give you more details than we have time to go into about. Keeps blacking out at random moments. I don't know about the GoToMeeting performance. I can see uh, <laughs> I can see the lights. It could be, it, it's hard to tell whether it's your individual device or if it's the other. Um, if you're getting feed is not supported when adding the RSS feed. Okay, first of all, uh, John uh, P, the feed address is you need to have after slash blog, you need slash feed. So I think I still have that in memory. Yeah. So you can see it up here at the top of my screen. Um, so it's what you've typed in, which is a Power BI blog, but then add slash feed to the end. The other thing is, is if you actually go to the blog web page and then hit the subscribe button, which is right here, and actually, if you just right click on it and copy link address, that will pull the feed address. That's how I got it. So just do that.
Okay, uh, it's just about 8.55, I know, almost noon, I guess, for <laughs> some of you. Um, so we're pretty much just about ready to wrap up. It looks like I can take one more question. So Max B, do you recommend to deliver models using analysis services or modeling direct data directly in Power BI? Um, definitely a year ago, I would have said use analysis services, hands down, no questions about that. Uh, right now, though, modeling data directly in Power BI works just about as well. The thing is, is that the Power BI desktop, if you are running Power BI desktop and then you go and you look at Task Manager, you will find that Power BI is actually running a mini version of analysis services. So it, it, it's actually using the analysis services engine. So the main reason why you would want to use analysis services instead of modeling in Power BI is if your company has decided that you really want something that's kind of set in stone, that you don't want them, you don't want the users modifying what comes in for a data source. Because if you're modeling data directly in Power BI, and if I have rights to go edit, if I download that PIVX file, I can go edit the data model, change the DAX, and then republish it. In, but with analysis services, when it's connected to that, really only the people in the IT department who own the analysis services database are going to be able to modify it. So it's kind of more of a choice of, do you want it more Wild West self-service, or do you want to have a lot of control over what you have for your data. That's really how you choose between analysis services or modeling directly in Power BI. Oh, apparently GovCloud misses a lot of features. I, I am sorry. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Integrate Python with, pa okay, Preeti asks, can we integrate Python with Power BI just like with R? Uh, let's check to see if they have added it. Yes, there is now a Python visual available, Preeti. I don't know if this is, I don't know when that came out. So I can't tell you. It is fairly new because I don't remember noticing it until you asked. So it could be something that just came out with the April one. But yes, if you love Python, uh, three tiers, you can actually now create Python visuals just like you could create R script visuals. Same functionality of Power BI data sets. To some degree, yes, Max. If you, it says, can you achieve the same functionality, which I assume from his previous question was, having a Power BI data set, can that function as if it were analysis services? Yes. If you have the Power BI data sets and people are using that as a reference, when I pull in that uh, Power BI data set, which I did, where to go? Here? Yes. You'll notice that this one here, this is the Azure Data Week stuff I pulled in as Power BI data set. If you look over on the left, you'll notice that I cannot go and manipulate the data set. So that is similar to what you've done with analysis services by saying, okay, you guys just pull in your data from the, these Power BI data sets. And now you do have that, that one source. The only thing is, is you do have to make sure that when they're referencing those data sets, that they always reference those, but they don't go and say, download a copy of the PIVX file from the data set, create their own PIVX file, and then go from there. Because then it wouldn't be really using the data set. They're actually downloading a copy of what you had. But yes, if they pull it in as a data set with get data, they're going to have the, the same functionality as if it was an analysis services. As PowerPoint, yes, you can, uh, Preeti. You can download a report as PowerPoint and as PDF. If I go back to Power BI, and of course this, oh, this doesn't have much of a, we now have, now, again, before I say anything else, your Power BI admin may have changed this, so you are not allowed to do that. But at least where Pragmatic works, I do have export to PDF and I do have export to PowerPoint as options. If these don't exist and you have an argument to say, hey, I think we really need these, 
then you would have to talk to your administrator to make sure you have it. But it is available on the files. Thanks. Yep, well, if it's not in the version you have, then that's probably it was restricted. So, and that does happen. Export URLs. The closest to an export URL that I've seen is you can, you can hit generate QR code. And this actually creates the equivalent of it. So if you took a picture of this and you had rights to that, you would be able to do that. Again, generate QR code may or may not be available in your Power BI because your administrator may have restricted it for some reasons. Okay, well, it's uh, 9 o'clock slash noon, so it looks like that about wraps it up. Thank you very much for everybody who came. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned a lot. All right. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. All right. For everybody else that's still online, um, you guys will receive a recording um, in your email tomorrow. So if you guys have any further questions until then, and this should be probably up on the site by the end of the day, but you guys will receive the recording to the webinar tomorrow. Um, but if you guys have any questions until then, please feel free to reach out to Andy or myself. And thank you guys so much for attending. And Andy, thank you again for hosting the webinar. We really appreciate it. All right. All right.